scripture today is Matthew 6, 5 through 15. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corner to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Father, we thank you for the privilege of worship. Sometimes, Father, I'm amazed at the great privileges we have through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross that opened the way for us into your presence. Just the concept of singing your praises. We really have no other claim to a right to come into your presence other than what Jesus has done. And even as Jesus taught us to pray, we, we thank you for the privilege of coming before you with our thoughts and our fears and our anxieties and our shame and our guilt and to know that we can lay it all at your feet. Father, I'm concerned about those who don't know that. I pray that in this congregation we will all be equipped both by our discipleship and, our, and your spirit to, to share those privileges with others. And draw many into your kingdom. Father, we want to be as a church a, a representative and a precursor to living in Jesus' physical presence. And we ask you to equip us for that. I want to thank you for the people that lead this church. The people that uh, greet in the foyer. The people that lead the Sunday school classes. The people that... that make the decisions for the future of this church. I thank you for the privilege we have of being part of a church that is reaching out to each other and to our community to give you glory. I pray that you'll guide our leaders to use what we offer you in, in thanksgiving for the great privileges you've given us. Use it in a way that builds your kingdom. It helps us to be closer to you and helps others come into an eternity that is pleasant. I thank you for the privilege of being part of what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen.
Uh, now, I realized I was sitting right there. <laughs> but it's like almost I could feel my hair blowing back. <laughs> that was powerful. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. What an awesome song. What an awesome offering to God. Uh, out of our skills and our talents to give him glory. I think that's just wonderful. Um, at this point, we would um, like to offer to the parents, if you would like your children to go to Children's Church, there's a lesson there that's a little more scaled to, to their age group, something that they can uh, build a foundation on to move into their further discipleship down the way. Uh, that's an option that we offer to the parents, and if you want to take advantage of that, this is a good time to be dismissed for that. While they're going out, I want to add my two cents worth on the testimonies last Sunday evening. I had a blast. I thought they were wonderful. Uh, we had, what, five or six different people that came and, and told their story, and I expected it to be all stories of how God led them to salvation. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised that some of them actually had stories of what God is still doing in their life today. And I thought it was a wonderful example of the different ways and the different content that can be in a testimony. Many people have told me recently that they don't feel like they have a testimony or they don't know what their testimony is. And this is a great way to learn, not just uh, what would be in your testimony, but uh, to see different examples of how to present it. Uh, so I encourage you to come the first of the the month next month and the month after that we've got planned as well and we hope we can extend this out into the future so that we can constantly be having a service where people tell their testimony not just people from this church but people from all over the community will be coming in and testifying to the fact that God is working it's the best way I know of to learn how to give your own testimony it's the same way it works with prayer the best way I know of to learn to pray is to pray. Now, some people have the um, anxiety and nervousness about the content of their prayer, the structure of their prayer, the vocabulary of their prayer. Now, if you want to learn uh, different aspects of prayer, probably the best discipleship opportunity we have for you is on Wednesday evenings. I want to invite all of you to come to our Wednesday evening prayer meeting. It starts at 6 o'clock. I do have a list of prayer prompts that we give, but we are not rigid with that. We can uh, add, subtract, uh, vary from that a little bit as the Spirit leads. And I do not put any pressure on anybody to pray out loud. I am uh, fully aware of the fact that the single greatest fear of the average American is public speaking. One survey actually said that public speaking was a bigger fear than death in the United States. So if you want to come and participate in the prayer meeting and learn how other people pray and their vocabulary, just come and, and pray silently along with us. We would love to have you come. We'd love to fill up the room. We meet at 6 o'clock right in there in the fellowship hall. Please plan on being there. Uh, since I've already spoken so much about prayer, let's take just a moment and do just that. Uh, Father, I want to thank you. I want to start by thanking you for prayer. The privilege we have of coming before you and to share our heart and our mind and, and our concerns and our joys with a Father who wants to hear us. As we look at the passage this morning where Jesus teaches on prayer, I ask you to encourage us that we have the same privilege of coming before you that Jesus taught about. I ask you to take over at this point and teach so that we can learn from the best teacher of all. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, just as a reminder, we are still on the road to Jerusalem. We are, have left from Caesarea Philippi, which is way north of Palestine. It's about uh, 30 miles north of the north end, end of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus is first going downhill, and then he'll go back uphill to Jerusalem. And we're looking at the different things that were on Jesus' mind as he was going to the last week of his life. We've already talked a little bit about the transition from that back in Luke chapter 9, the transition from his public ministry to a more private ministry with his apostles and the journey that's starting to go to his crucifixion. 
We've looked at the uh, tale of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and the compassion that was on Jesus' mind as he went up to his death. This week, I want to look at prayer, and I want to show you several things that might surprise you about prayer in a message that I'm calling Ignored. Now, I know a little bit about being ignored. In the last few years, I've had a couple of stories. One of them worked out real well for me, and one of them didn't, where people were ignoring me. The first one was a, a, a plumbing link that I had. My upstairs bathroom was leaking. Uh, the bathtub was leaking onto the floor, and it was seeping through, and the, the ceiling underneath, it's a little sitting room that my daughter uses as a bedroom, and, and uh, the ceiling was starting to collapse, and so I decided I'd better get that fixed, and I knew better than to try to do it myself, so I called a plumber. And he came in, and he said, well, looks like we're going to have to pull the ceiling down, and we're going to have to replace all these pipes, and it'll cost you about this much money. And I said, well, that... I didn't tell him this, but to myself, I said, that wasn't near as much as I thought it would be. So I asked him about it. And I said, so you're going to pull the ceiling down. You're going to put the pipes, new pipes in, and you're going to replace the ceiling, right? And he said, yep, that's the, that's the deal. And I said, okay, that's great. How long will I not be able to use this room? How long will it be until you get that ceiling put back in? And he gave me a time, and I thought, well, that's really good. So I said, so I'll sign a contract with you where you'll come in and uh, Tear the ceiling down, put the new pipes in, and put a new ceiling in. I said it three times. And he said, oh, we don't need a contract. We'll just, we'll just do the work. That was my biggest mistake right there. He came in, he pulled all that ceiling down, and got it down in a couple of minutes, I think. And then he put in all the pipes, took a couple of days, just like he said, and then he went home. I thought, well, it's the end of the day. They're going home. They didn't come back the next day. They didn't come back for several days. So I called him, and he didn't answer the phone. He didn't call me back. So I waited a few days. I called him again, and he didn't answer the phone, and he never called me back. So finally, I went into his place of business, and I said, I think you forgot to put the ceiling back in my, my sitting room. And he said, oh, we don't do that. And I said, but you told me you would. And he says, no, what, what I meant was I know a guy who will do it for you. Okay, I knew where I was standing at that point. And I had a, a series of situations like that where craftsmen would be, you know, not real interested in doing my work. So a couple of years later, when we had that windstorm, I kind of knew what was coming. It blew off several of the shingles on my roof. It was about all three or four shingles wide and two or three high, and they just blew away. They were completely gone, and I figured, well, I'll have to get that patched. And, you know, my house is two and a half or three, almost three stories high. And I didn't want to climb up there, so I decided I'd call somebody. So I asked around, found a roofer, and I called him, and he said, I'll come by and look at it. I'll call you. A week later, he didn't call me back. So I called another roofer. He says, I'll drive by and look at it sometime. He never called me back. I, I called a third roofer. I think I called every roofer in town. I think I, if you'd been watching me, I was driving down the road with a notepad in my hand, and I was driving next to these roofers to writing down their phone number while I was driving so I could get a roofer to come out and fix my roof. One guy said, well, I'll be there at such and such a time. So I was waiting on the front porch for him, and I watched him drive by. I mean, he's got his name on the side of the truck, and he just drove right by. So I called him, and he said, oh, that's not a big enough job for me. He actually said to me, I've got more important things to do. Well, I knew I had to get it done, so I got on the internet and I searched for a, a national or, or a, a bigger, you know, a regional or a chain company, somebody who'd do my roof. I found this, this company that I knew the name of anyway, Standard Roofers, and they had a local phone number, so I called them and I said, will you come and at least look at it? He says, yeah, I'll be there at such and such a time. So I was on the front porch. He actually came. He parked on the curb, and he said, can you move your car? And I thought, all right, I got more now out of him than anybody else. So I pulled my car out of the driveway. He set up his ladder. He climbed up to where his eyes were just level with the, uh, the guttering. And he looked to the left, and he looked to the right, and he climbed right back down. I thought, oh, here we go again. He handed me his business card, and he said, call your insurance company. I said, what? I says, I got a deductible on my insurance plan. It's not going to cover 
I mean, this is not going to be as expensive as my deductible. I got to pay this out of pocket. And he says, no, call your insurance company. And I said, why? That makes no sense. It's just a few shingles. Just tack them up there and be, be done with it. He said, no, you need to call your insurance company. You're going to like it. So I, he left. I called my insurance company right away. He said, I'll be there at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. He climbed up on the roof. He walked around the whole roof. He took out his measuring tape. He measured the whole roof. He came back down. He did a little paperwork. And he said, uh, tomorrow morning, we're going to send you a check for $14,000. He said, it'll cost $15,000 to do your, uh, your new roof. And uh, we're going to pay the $14,000 because your deductible is 1000 And I said, what? He said, yeah, the guy who put that roof on didn't do it right. We got to take the whole thing back to the rafters. And we're going to do your garage too. I think there's a lot of roofers out there that were driving around town seeing my job wishing they hadn't ignored me. Because they made a lot of money on that and it didn't cost me a cent because the roofer said, when you, come, when you, when you get the, the quote, I'll write off your deductible. He says, I want this job. So it was that big a job. Now, hopefully you've not experienced being ignored quite to that level. But I think most of us have experienced being ignored at some point. Guys, my clicker's not working again. I don't know what the computer did. But uh, I think most of you have probably at some point sat in a doctor's office waiting room feeling like, boy, they're not paying much attention to me. Or, or you may have gone to a party with, you know, I don't know, maybe your wife or your husband has a Christmas party at work and you go in and he knows everybody and you don't know anybody and they all just kind of ignore you. Or maybe you've gone to the mechanic. I, I was talking to somebody this week. He was telling me how he went to the mechanic and he told the mechanic, I need a new alternator. And this guy happened to be a mechanic, but he didn't want to do the work. So he went in and he wanted a new alternator put on. And the guy said, well, we, it might be the alternator, but we better try this first. And then we need to try this. And then when that didn't work, they had to try the third thing. And by the fourth or the fifth step, they said, well, you were probably right. You do need an alternator. They just don't want to know your opinion. It makes us wonder. If people we can see, and people can see us, can so easily ignore us. Does God ignore us? Does God say, wait, I've got more important things to do? Or does God listen? I think that's what Jesus is actually talking about in our passage today. Now, um, Dwayne read uh, the Lord's Prayer passage for us out of Matthew. I'm going to be speaking in the Lord's Prayer passage out of uh, Luke this morning, Luke chapter 11. If you want to turn there, you can follow me. And I think that what Jesus is going to tell us this morning is that God never ignores us. God always pays attention to us. If you notice, it starts with Jesus praying. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said to them, When you pray, say... We'll come back to what he said. But Jesus apparently was praying in public. Jesus was praying in such a way that other people can see him praying. And it's an interesting study sometimes to, to go through the book of Luke and mark all the different places where it mentions Jesus' prayer. This is the Son of God. And he saw the need to pray. And he prayed in such a way that his disciples could see it. And they got curious. And they wanted to learn. And so they asked Jesus to teach. And when Jesus heard that question, he said, when you pray, say. Sometimes we got to pay attention to those little words. See, in the passage that Dwayne read in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching basically the same material but with a different purpose. In Matthew, he's, pre he's teaching on prayer early in his year of popularity. 
be the, the second year of his ministry, roughly speaking. He's, he's becoming very popular. Lots of people are listening to him. And he's giving the Sermon on the Mount. And he's trying to convince the people that you can pray just regular words. He's kind of reacting to the Pharisees' tendency to be very verbose and, and very articulate with their prayers and give very formal and impressive prayers where Jesus is saying in Matthew, just pray like this. And then he, boom, 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 like bullet points, just very simple prayers. In this one, he's been asked, how do we pray? In Matthew, he said, when you pray, pray like this. In Luke, he says, when you pray, say. In Matthew, he's saying, when you pray, pray simply like this. But here he uses the word say. To start with, in the Greek, it's indicative. It's not the right word. It's not indicative. It's a command. It's imperative. You have to do this. But the word itself, in other contexts, can be translated, quote. I grew up in a Lutheran church. And one of the criticisms that I got most in that Lutheran church was, I don't like that liturgical worship. It's all written out. There's nothing spontaneous. It's all scripted. It's not authentic. And besides, they'd say, that's not what the Bible says to do. Except right here, it does. Jesus is saying... What I'm about to say to you, you can quote to God. It's a prayer that will cover anything, any catastrophe, any anxiety, any frustration, any fear will be covered in this prayer somewhere. What he's basically saying to us is prayer is simple. Prayer is a communication. You've all heard this. Prayer is a communication between you and God. But sometimes God can be a little overwhelming. So when you're overwhelmed, just say this. Just say these words. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Boy, what's not covered in that one brief bullet list? Our relationship with the Father, His kingdom and His coming, our needs. Daily bread can mean anything from the food we eat, to the home we live in, to the wisdom to do our work. Forgive us our sins. Matthew's version says debts as we forgive our debtors. Father, I'm letting them all off the hook because you've let me off the hook. And lead us not into temptation, but help me, basically help me live a, a holy life that honors you. The Lord's prayer pattern is a great prompt for prayers. I encourage you to memorize it because you'll use it. You'll find the Spirit leading you to use it. The next thing he tells us is to be shameless. He starts with a, a little bit of a parable here. In verse 5, he says, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because of his, he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. I, I can't imagine somebody banging on my door at midnight and saying, hey, I just started a party over there and I'm out of food. Can you loan me some? But Jesus is comparing us to the man who needs the food and the friend to God. And even, you know, even a real earthly friend may not get up and help you because you're friends, because, you know, we're people. We're like that. We don't always follow through. 
But if you just keep pestering him, eventually he'll give it to you. That's not a word you hear pastors say very often on the platform. Just keep pestering God and he'll answer your prayers. But that's what impudence means. It means not paying attention to the social conventions. It means basically shamelessly repeating the prayer. I frequently hear that from Christians. I prayed for six whole days. I prayed for two weeks. How long do I have to pray? Well, Jesus is saying keep praying until you get the answer. Keep praying until you get, you get the answer. And then he goes on to say, if you do, you'll get the answer. He teaches next to be steadfast in prayer. This is starting in verse, verse 9. He says, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Serpent, think fully grown diamondback rattlesnake. Is that really the kind of pet you want your kid to have? Kid has asked for a little fish in a bowl. Would you give him a rattlesnake for a pet instead? Jesus says, your father's not like that. Verse 12, he says, or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. Just think about that. Kid comes in and says, can I have breakfast? And you say, well, you could, but you haven't done your chores yet. You got to go take care of your scorpion. We would never do that to a child. And God won't do that either. Then verse 13 is the kicker here. He says, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, I've, I've told you this before. I have a tendency to mark in my Bible. I got a four-color pen that's erasable. It's got different colors, and I can erase them and change them. And, and I've marked one word in this last paragraph. Everyone. You know what everyone means? Everyone. Everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. Everyone who knocks will have it open for them. That's a pretty bold statement. I'm going to tell you, I'll explain it in a few minutes, but I'm going to tell you that's been my experience. That God answers every prayer. In fact, that's the summation of what Jesus has taught now in response to teach us to pray. The only thing he really wanted this disciple to know is that any prayer offered in faith will be heard. It doesn't have anything to do with your vocabulary. It doesn't have anything to do with your eloquence. It's just your faith. Do you believe God will hear? He will hear. And so the, the application of this teaching at the time of Jesus and the, today is the same. And many of you have already figured this out. It's a pretty simple thing to figure out. If the, this is the teaching, then the application is pray. Just pray. Pray. Keep it simple. Don't try to make it eloquent. You're not going to impress God anyway. Trust me, he's got a better vocabulary than you do. Okay? Just keep it simple. Keep it honest. I can't not get this, God. I've got to have it. Please give it to me. And keep it coming. Folks, I, I hand out the prayer prompts on Wednesday night. And some of those prayers have been on there since before I came. And we're still praying for them. Because I don't believe it upsets God one bit if we keep praying. Now there will be times when he'll speak to you and the, 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 the passion for that prayer request will go away and you'll be convinced that God has already taken that into consideration and you'll naturally drift away from it. But you don't have to quit just because it's been three hours and 45 minutes and you haven't had an answer yet. Keep going. As you pray, be confident of several things. 
Be confident of the fact that you're not ignored. God doesn't have your prayer sitting in some heavenly waiting room waiting for the important things to get done and be over with so he can get around to you. You're important to him. Be confident of the fact that he hears your prayer. Every word. You know, there's a, a passage in Revelation. I should have looked it up beforehand, but there's a passage in Revelation where he says, he tells the entire heavenly population to be silent. And the context is he's listening for that one sinner that's praying. He wants to hear your prayers. He listens to every word. If it helps, you can think of God as the great father in heaven sitting in his uh, heavenly lazy boy with you sitting on his lap as a toddler. He's listening to you with the same intensity that you listen to those little children who have something terribly important to tell you about their best friend down the street or whatever it is. He hears every word and he answers every single prayer. I'm going to suggest this evening, this evening, boy, my clock's off, isn't it? I'm going to suggest this morning that God grants every request that's presented before him. Oh, sometimes he'll say yes. Sometimes he'll just give it to you, and we miss it so often. You know, it's that, it's that prayer that we prayed when our daughters were teenagers and they were on their first date and we prayed they'd come home safe. He answered that prayer. It, it's that prayer that, that, you know, you'd make it to work on time in that blizzard. He answered that prayer. It's that prayer that when you sent your child off to college and they came back still a believer. He answered that prayer. Those little prayers that we sometimes forget we even asked. He says yes to. Sometimes he says no. I thank God for that. There's one prayer that I have come to, and I hope I can explain this in a, in a proper way, but there's one prayer that he says no to for everyone eventually that I'm kind of glad he does because I've taken the time to imagine what it'd be like if he said yes every time, and that's the prayer for healing. I'm kind of glad that God eventually says no. It's time to be done on earth. I mean, stop and think about it. Without death, you never get into the presence of God. Believers never get that ultimate promise of going into Jesus' physical presence. Think about it. If he answered every prayer oh, for heal grandma because she's sick or heal grandpa because he's, not, he, he's on his deathbed, if he answered every prayer like that since Noah... Think how, pop, how crowded this world would be. Think of how people's bodies would continue to degenerate and continue to suffer without the release of death. Eventually, all of us are going to have that prayer answered with the word no. I think... Perhaps, I can't prove this, but perhaps the most common answer that, G, that God gives when we pray is wait. See, I've, I've learned to picture time as a box. It starts here, it goes over here, there's a bunch of stuff going on inside of it, but God is way up here. And God can see from the beginning what the end is like. And he can see what's going to happen if he answers our prayers. And the things that are going to happen down the road. And some of those things might not be what we think they would be. And so he has to do something else before he can answer our prayer. He has to answer somebody else's prayer. Or he has to adjust somebody else's life. Or he has to provide a, a wish for someone else. Sometimes he says, wait. But I think ultimately... God grants every prayer because he has the ability to see what we can't. He looks into our heart and says, what would they pray if they knew what I knew? That's what I'm going to give. You just see, if we knew what God knows, we wouldn't pray the way we do. Our prayers would be a lot different. 
If we knew what God knows, everything we asked would be exactly what he wanted to give anyway. And so God looks at every prayer that you ask, every request you make, and says, I'm going to give them something even better. I'm going to give them what they would ask for if they knew what I know. Because the truth is, if we knew what he knew, we wouldn't pray the way we do. Our prayers would change. So just a minute ago, I told you about a prayer that God always eventually denies, always gives the answer no to. But you know there's one prayer that God always says yes to? There is one prayer that God will say yes to every time. It involves three attitudes and one request. The first attitude is the acceptance that God exists. I always like to start at this one because if you don't believe God exists, what are you praying for anyway? It's kind of an exercise in futility. But once you get to the point where you accept the fact that God exists, He's real. He created, He exists today, He will exist forever. Then that changes your attitude. And it leads to the second attitude because we begin to understand that we are not what we're supposed to be. There's a verse in Romans that says that we, all of us, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God intended us to be a certain way, and we've blown it. Notice in the, the Lord's Prayer, he talks about forgiving our sins as we forgive everyone who's indebted to us. We've all sinned. We can all pray that prayer, forgive us our sins. Even after we put our trust in Jesus Christ, we find out I'm blowing it. Sometimes we get feeling like we blow it even more often because now we're aware of it. But after we've realized that it is our brokenness, our sinfulness, our guilt that separates us from God, the next attitude we have to have is that Jesus came to pay that price. We, we sang about it earlier. He, he paid our debt. We couldn't pay it. It says the wages of sin is death. That's permanent separation from God. But Jesus paid that for us. So once we have those three attitudes, the, the reality of God, the reality of our sin, and the reality of what Jesus Christ has done, then the request is obvious. Can I have that, please? Because God wants to give it to you as a gift. He wants you to receive that at no cost. Jesus has already paid it. He wants you to receive that without the burden of thinking, well, now that I've received this, I've got to do certain things for God to, you know, to pay him back, kind of. Oh, we'll want to be different. But that's more out of respect for God. That's more out of gratitude than it is to earn it. We have to receive it. And folks, you can receive this gift anytime, anywhere. You don't have to come to the front of the church. You don't have to be kneeling in exactly this place. No, move over three centimeters. You don't have to say the right words. No, stop. I'll tell you what to pray. Don't come to the pastors and say, please tell me what to pray. That's not salvation. That's idolatry. That's valuing me, whoever the pastor is, over the Jesus who died for you. Ideally, this takes place in your heart. It can happen right here in the chair you're in. It can happen in your car. It can happen in your bedroom tonight. Simply receive the gift. How do you receive any other gift? You take everything else out of your hands and you hold your hands out and God will put it in there. God will tell you what to pray. God will help you live a life that comes closer to the glory He intended for you to start with. God always says yes to that prayer. Every time. So as you walk out of here today, the one thing I want you to remember, always remember, no matter what the answer is, God hears your prayers. God does not ignore you. 
He cares. And he'll answer your prayer the way you would have prayed it if you'd known what he knows, which is even better anyway. Let's close today in prayer. Father, I want to thank you. What a great privilege to study your word and to to hold it in our hands and to know that you care for us, that you hear when we pray to you, and that as we read and we pray, we grow into the glory you originally intended for us. I ask you to help each one of us become the person you intended us to be. Become disciples of Jesus Christ and learn from him and grow and glorify him for what he's done for us. Father, if there's anybody in this room that's never taken that first step, I ask you not to let go of them. Just make them uncomfortable. Just just bring them constantly under that conviction that they need the gift Jesus gives until they enter your kingdom and can experience that growth as well. For the rest of us, help us to be diligent in our prayers, passionate in our prayers, shameless in our boldness, Father, help us to never give up so you can get the glory in our lives as well. I pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen.